Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Uh, well, a lot of people have been asking me about RSV, a respiratory syncytial virus, and we've spent a lot of time talking about COVID, and I'll, I'll summarize all of COVID for the country, about the same as last week. So, uh, so instead of talking about COVID today, we're going to talk about RSV. So RSV was discovered in 1956, and it's been recognized now as one of the most common respiratory viruses that uh, young children get. It's also we have recurrent infection in older folks too. By the time a kid is two years old, they, almost every single child has had RSV. And in most parts of the country, it circulates oh, late, starting about now, no November to February. Uh, it is, in young children, a really potentially severe illness. Mostly it causes just like a, a cold-like symptom, but in one to two percent, uh, it can be quite severe and children get hospitalized. Worldwide, it's actually a very significant problem. In 2019, for example, there were 3.6 million children hospitalized with RSV and over 100,000 deaths. Most of those deaths occur in countries that don't have access to good infant care. Because as you'll see, as we talk about it, it really is a disease that causes a lot of problems in the respiratory tract. Uh, and if kids have any kind of immune, uh, response, immune, immune problem or cardiac or lung disease, uh, it can be really a big problem. Now, COVID, because we had such distancing and isolation of, of kids, <laughs> daycare shut down, everything. The last couple of years, RSV has really been not very prominent. And so what that has done is a, it created a very large population of susceptible children, which is why we're seeing a different, uh, different kind of uh, RSV season. RSV also occurs in adults. Uh, most people who get infected with respiratory syncytial virus have mild symptoms, just another upper respiratory infection with a runny nose, uh, maybe pharyngitis and a cough, maybe some headache. But uh, there are adults over the age of 65 in particular who can get very severe disease. Usually they have uh, some other underlying problem like heart disease or lung disease, but it can, it can cause severe uh, pneumonia and, and about 180,000 Adults are, are hospitalized each year with RSV, and about 14,000 each year um, die from the disease. Now, the syncytial virus is a human orthopneumovirus. Uh, it's uh, one of the very most contagious respiratory virus. It's a negative single-stranded RNA virus. And the reason it's named is infected cells tend to fuse and cause what is known as uh, a syncytium. And I'll show you a picture of that. These are cells infected individually with RSV, but you can see this giant cluster of cells where the cell membranes fuse, and that's called a syncytium, and that's why the virus is called respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, in children, you can imagine if that's going on in the epithelial cells, it can cause a pretty severe bronchial infection called bronchiolitis uh, and even pneumonia. Uh, so it's a, it can be very, very significant. Uh, it usually starts off with infection in the eyes or nose, upper pharynx, and then moves down. Uh, into the upper airways and even, as I said, it uh, can cause pneumonia. This is what it looks like. It's a pretty common looking virus, but I want to point out there's this one protein called the, called the fusion protein. That's the protein that's responsible for bind, binding cells together. And this is what the virus looks like when it buds out of a cell. The reason why I talk about that fusion protein is that's a target of a potential vaccine. Now it's transmitted uh, through contaminated air droplets, a typical respiratory virus. It can spread when somebody coughs or sneezes. You can, you know, just imagine the daycare setting. I mean, one kid has that, you know, every single kid's going to get it. Uh, and you can also get it by direct uh, contact on surfaces. Most adults get it from kissing their babies or grandchildren because the kids are, have runny noses and stuff. Uh, I do that with my grandchildren. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm going to get something bad. And in our, in our office, everybody's got grandkids who's now got a cold. So I think it's probably could well be RSV. Uh, and it can, as I mentioned, it can be pretty severe. Most of the time, it, you're contagious. The kids are contagious for five to six, seven days. But if you're immune compromised, you can remain contagious for a very long time. Uh, but it is very common that children are exposed in school or in daycare settings, anywhere where there's clustering of children. And of course, they bring all that stuff home, which is why I love having a dog instead of a little child. Uh, it can be diagnosed with an antigen test just like we do for COVID. RT-PCR is also a pretty good test, uh, a very good test. Uh, the antigen capture test is about the same as uh, COVID test, 80 to 90%. And let, let me just show you some real data. This is uh, 
the, it really interesting because if you look at the seasonal uh, variation, it's quite remarkable. 2018, 2019, before the pandemic, was pretty typical fall, uh, fall spike in cases. But because of, uh, if you look at 2020 during the COVID pandemic, there was almost nothing. And then it, it sort of it emerged earlier in June, July, and August, which is really kind of very different, uh, but it's because of the, the COVID issue. When you look at hospitalizations, it's like the opposite of COVID, where if you're infected over the age of 65, you're likely to be hospitalized. This is exactly the opposite. Under the age of six months, one year, the younger you are, the more likely you are to be infected, uh, to be hospitalized from infection. Uh, the interesting thing is if you think about why all, what this virus causes a lot of fluid, a lot of secretions, and you have to be able to cough that stuff up. Young uh, children with very small airways and not a lot of muscle strength in their chest walls have a lot of trouble clearing those secretions, which is why they tend to get more severe bronchiolitis and pneumonia. And the interesting thing, again, is if you look at what's happened, the, the pandemic has really ch changed with COVID. Uh, there was all the susceptible population. So we actually had a spring peak in 2021 and now we're seeing, uh, we saw a spring peak again in 2022 and now a fall peak uh, that's going on right now. And that's what everyone's concerned about, the big uh, peak in, uh, of RSV now. But we had these susceptible populations uh, during the COVID pandemic that hadn't been exposed. So when they were exposed, you saw these little spring peaks. My guess is over the next few years, it'll go back to being a typical uh, just um, uh, a peak in the fall. So what are the treatments? Uh, it's been really difficult to develop a vaccine against RSV for many, many reasons. For one, uh, they're small, you know, they're young kids. So having, showing efficacy in a vaccine in under two, you can see how long it took us to get even approval uh, for COVID in young children. Same thing for RSV. Uh, but uh, you would think that this is an ideal way to control the virus over time. This is only in humans. So if we actually developed an effective vaccine, we could eliminate this, this virus potentially. Uh, there is no intermediate host, for example. But because of the young age, it's been hard to, be, to develop one. There's multiple mechanisms for the RSV to avoid uh, immunity. There's also, even if you're naturally infected, there's not durable immunity. So people get re kids get reinfected, people get reinfected, so we don't have a, a, long, a, a clear pathway to have durable immunity. And we don't have animal models to test it. And so it's really been difficult uh, to develop a vaccine but Pfizer has developed a really good vaccine and is looking for approval. This one is interesting. Uh, there were problems with early vaccines that actually enhanced the disease. This is one of the concerns people have with RSV. And so it was not approved to give to kids. This one is given to pregnant women. And they, uh, it was 80% effective at preventing uh, RSV, severe RSV in infants in the first three months of life. And it also reduced the um, uh, t need for the a baby to be seen by a doctor by 50%. It didn't meet all of the endpoints of the trial, so the FDA is considering it, but this is one of the first uh, really advances. There doesn't seem to be a safety problem, and if we can do this and protect kids within, for, in the first six months to two years of life, this would really be a major breakthrough. Uh, the, uh, the Senior Vice President for Vaccine Development Advisor, a proud Baylor graduate, William Gruber, well, is pretty excited about this, and they plan to submit this to the FDA for approval. There's also a really interesting paper that was published in the spring in the New England Journal on monoclonal antibodies. It took 1,490, almost 1,500 infants, randomized two to one to receive a single intramuscular injection of nirsevimab, which is a, a monoclonal antibody directed to that F protein that I mentioned, that fusion protein. And what it did is just one injection uh, was incredibly effective. If you look at the treatment group for the percentage of patients with respiratory infection, serious adverse infections, or lower respiratory infection in each case was dramatically lower. And so if you get a single dose during our, right before RSV season, it lowered the risk of medically attended RSV-associated respiratory tract infection. It was really very effective. So now there are two effective, potential uh, uh, effective therapies that are approved. Uh, vaccine and the monoclonal antibody. We're lucky today to have Dr. Flor Munoz, uh, to, who's a real pediatrician and an expert in RSV, to talk about uh, RSV with us. You've been in this for a long time, so uh, can you tell us, first of all, what's uh, how's the season looking? Is it looking as bad as everybody talks about? It is. It is pretty bad, and it is, I think, what we were 
thinking would happen last year mm -hmm. when we had um, post-pandemic uh, resurgence of uh, RSV, but it happened in the summer and mm -hmm. we thought it was going to continue in the winter. It didn't really happen that way. It's happening. Uh, we had a very mild summer outbreak and yeah, now we are, yes, this year, so and our peak is going Why up. do you think it wasn't so bad last year? <laughs> you know, it's interesting because we did have a susceptible population, yeah. right? We had right. a year without RSV and then a summer outbreak right. where you know it's it's hard to tell i i don't know that i have an answer for you on that but we were lucky it didn't get worse do you think social distancing and mask probably, wearing probably. And all that stuff? Yes, it's yeah. probably because, you know, we did have just the Delta wave and then Omicron. And so people were still very cautious. We were still not sending children to school. We were still being, you know, protective about that. Yeah. Um, I get more, I'm not a pediatrician, and yet I get more people calling me saying, my child is sick. When, when should a mother or father decide to call the physician or take the physician or take the baby or child to the doctor? When would, that's yeah. a, always a tough question. It is, but you know we have um, documents out there, information out there for parents, for pediatricians about warning signs, mm -hmm. and that's true for any respiratory illness. So we're talking about RSV, but for flu especially, we also have been um, talking about that every year. And so it is, um, it really, the parents know their children better than anybody else. And it's really important for them to be able to take on cues when their right, baby right. is not wanting to eat, when they're not um, active enough as they should be, when they might be having uh, more trouble breathing right, and, right. Uh, you know, doing the normal things that they do. Yeah, I like the thought that parents know their kids better than everybody else. I'm still trying to figure out my two kids, but you know, I'm sure that <laughs> they, when they they're will, babies, they I, will I be remember able, when they were babies. Right, they'll be able to see <laughs> things that even, you know, they're, they're, maybe their physician won't be able to notice. So we, we need to listen as physicians. <laughs> yes, and I've, I've seen a lot of uh, doctors' statements that, you know, don't, if for well visits now, don't bring your kid because there's so many respiratory uh, illness is going around. What do you what do you think about that? Well, we are in a special situation this year, as we're saying. So certainly, we're having um, a confluence of RSV, influenza, and still a little COVID. bit of COVID out there, in addition to the other respiratory viruses, right. because the common cold viruses are still around. So um, we are seeing that happening right. uh, quite a bit, not just in the hospitals, but even in practices that people are being told not to come if they don't have an emergency or something that needs medical attention. Fortunately, I think we have telemedicine now, and we have. Mm -hmm. The ability to have these discussions with parents even if they're not physically uh, in the office but i think it's necessary right now to be uh, aware of the fact that the our medical services are being overwhelmed by the current outbreaks yeah, it's a good idea to just call right and just talk to the pediatrician Absolutely. so we i had run over some of the data that was why it's been so difficult to develop a vaccine uh, over the many years i mean decades of trying now we hear that there may be uh, a vaccine on the horizon. Can you tell me a little bit about that and whether that's exciting news? Super exciting news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to say I am biased. Mm -hmm. My work and research has been on maternal vaccines, on respiratory viruses, and here at Texas Children's and Baylor, we actually did the very first maternal immunization trial on an RSV vaccine back in the late 90s, and I was part of that. And so uh, what we have heard this week is that um, Pfizer has uh, now a vaccine that has uh, completed a phase three clinical trial, or have they have data on this phase three trial, where uh, women who are pregnant can receive a vaccination to prevent infant disease. And they wow. just share the, their data, it's very nice, 82% uh, protection against severe RSV disease in the first six months of life. Uh, certainly the first nine months, I'm uh, sorry, 90 days are going to be critical, but they are able to show, they were able to show persistence of the protection up to a about 70% uh, at six months. So wow. it's a very, uh, um, outstanding accomplishment because others have tried and this is a work that has been going on for decades at this point. Yeah, that's uh, one of the most resistant uh, childhood infections for uh, to develop a, an effective vaccine. And, and we, exactly, so we yeah. don't have a vaccine for children because also for decades, there have been attempts to develop vaccines that would need to be given very early in life right. because, again, those first 90 days are critical for RSV. And uh, we've shown, we've seen that um, immunity at that age is difficult to be achieved. Mm -hmm. There's maternal antibodies. There might be just an immaturity. And also the fact that you need um, intranasal vaccines, so live vaccines, which 
are quite reactogenic. So the balance between um, causing a lot of nasal inflammation and congestion with the vaccine and producing immunity has been very difficult to achieve. Great. Well, Dr. Munoz, thank you for taking the time. Our viewers will be thrilled to get an expert like you to advise them. Thank you very much. And thanks for being part of Baylor and Texas Children's Hospital. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And I want to finish today with shout outs. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Ellen Friedman on receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Texas Association of Otolaryngology. Also want to congratulate the Houston Astros. Lily was a big fan, the big supporter this year. What a great year. More than a million people showed up in downtown Houston uh, for the championship parade. And of course, today is Veterans Day, honoring military vet veterans of the United States Armed Forces. Please take a moment to think about and thank those who have served uh, our country. Uh, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.